All right, everyone, welcome to um, Breckenridge, Colorado. Um, this year's home of the um, Glenn Gerberg Weather and Climate Summit, Climate and Weather Summit. Um, we are hosting that here at Breckenridge and the Doubletree, and we're so, so, so excited this year to add an event to let some of our most favorite meteorologists um, interact with um, our local population. So, um, so thank you guys so much for coming. And I'll have to say that um, we have a, get a lot of stars in this town, but um, I've never received quite the feedback I get when Jim Cantore comes into town. Um, and his thought was why, and I'm like, because we are obsessed with weather here. So, um, so it's really exciting to see you guys here, and, um, and we're glad to have you. Um, I will note we are broadcasting this live on the internet, and um, we'll be also doing that live streaming tomorrow for the last day of the conference. So we've been tweeting out locations to watch, but we'd love for you to tune in tomorrow even as part of the local population. So, um, so these guys are really nice and fun, but let me tell you who they are. <laughs> so Dale Eck is the director of the Global Forecast Center um, in, at the Weather Channel, and he's the one that kind of brought this crazy conference to Breckenridge. And um, huge respect for this man and, and just, just taught me a ton about weather, life, etc. cetera, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and this one needs no introduction. Jim Cantori, of course, oh, probably the most famous weatherman, America's weatherman is what I like to call him. Um, yeah. Yay. <laughs> um, oh, but, nice. but the thing I'm most excited about is that the, these guys are great men, and I respect them a ton, and um, very thoughtful and kind, and so I'm excited for your interaction with them today. So I'm going to turn it over to Dale Eck. And you have to return all those compliments. All right, I will do that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, actually, the reason I um, thought I'd give you a little bit of background, I've actually, Jim and I have both worked at the Weather Channel now for 26 years. You know who Jim is. You don't know who I am. And maybe I hope I can shed a little bit of light on why that is. Um, you go back a little bit on me, but it's mostly going to turn to Jim. Um, I worked with the gentleman who went to the Weather Channel when it started in 1982. Um, he worked, we worked together at a private weather forecasting firm, and he worked up the ranks and actually headed up the on-camera department, and he was the one that hired the talent that came to the Weather Channel. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to him saying, hey, Ray, I'd really like to get to the Weather Channel. Hey, he goes, well, Dale, you're just going to have to get some experience. I just can't hire someone just fresh out of, even though you've got good forecasting skills, you've got to get comfortable in front of the camera. And that's how, if you want to get here, you're going to have to take that step. I got my first job in Macon, and then I got to the Weather Channel. It was about six months after mm -hmm. Jim. But I, during that time I was in Macon, I would go up to Atlanta, and I'd kind of give Ray my tape, go, can I, can I get a job? Can I get a job? And he goes, keep working, keep working. And then he turned to me one time. I was showing him my tape. He goes, there's this kid at a Linden State University. He goes, he doesn't have a lot of experience, but I just, my gut says, I need to take a chance on this kid. Young Italian kid with the dark hair. <laughs> um, That's right. Anyway, so a long story leads to another. So he took a shot at Jim, and Jim did very well. And the reason Jim did very well is because of his, first of all, his passion for the weather. I mean, he loves the weather. He went to school for the weather. He grew up loving snow in New Hampshire. New Vermont. Vermont. Yep. And I actually, that was the reason I ended up in the same field. I didn't have as much snow in Pennsylvania, but I still loved the snow. So... For fast forward two, three years, I get promoted to supervisor, and Jim Cantori is now working for me. So as a supervisor, and there's another one in the crowd, Cindy Presler, that I uh, supervised, um, part of my job was to try to help our talent get as good as they can be. They're on the air at that time four hours a day, so it's hard to keep your energy level up. And that was one of the main things I had to coach everybody on. <coughs> but in this guy's case, I just had to try to harness the enthusiasm that he had for the weather. Uh, example, Jim, that was great. He goes, didn't I do great on that? I go, yes, but you went over by two minutes. And you left <laughs> your partner right. scrambling to do the five-day planner in 30 seconds. Or, and That's then you right. get another one. You go, okay, Jim, it's your turn. You're going to do the five-day planner. He'd spend two minutes talking about a squall line going through Indianapolis, and he'd spend 20 seconds going, here's day three, day four, day five, and he'd get through it. So he had so much passion for the weather, you just... Our goal was to try to harness that. And then over the years, as his supervisor, I'd sit there and I'd go, why can't I do that? I love the weather. And in this business, there's just some people that have the X factor. And Jim definitely has that. And that's why most people in this country know who Jim Cantori is uh, today. 
One other thing I did want to mention is while Jim has the enthusiasm for the weather, and as a young kid out of college, you know, it was all about that. Look at this. Look what's going on here. I think over the years of Jim being out in the field covering these events, I think Jim saw the other side of the weather, which is how it impacts people adversely, people that lose their lives because of Mother Nature, people that have to start over. And I think Jim's passion for weather has transferred into his passion for protecting people from the weather. And I think that's why he is so good about what he does. And um, we're just glad we have him and that he represents the Weather Channel so well. And the other good part about it, this guy could have an ego as big as this room. He is a down-to-earth person, and he'll be happy to talk to you after this and maybe get a picture. One thing that Jim and I do have in common, and we're going to start, we're going to, tonight's, I, the, I, the idea of tonight's talk is to talk about things that Jim has done in the field, allow you to see some of the clips, and then to be able to ask Jim questions or for Jim to set up what was going on when this clip took place. I'm going to introduce the first one, which is, as both of us being meteorologists, both of us loving snow, that's why we love to come out here, as cold as it is, as high as the altitude is, and it takes us some time to adjust, we're out here because we love the snow. One of the best things for a meteorologist is to be out in a blizzard, out in a snowstorm. It's just dumping three, four, five inches an hour. And every once in a while, it gets so dynamic that you actually get thunder during a snowstorm. And I think Jim has been a magnet for that. <laughs> and it has added to what he has seen in the field. So this clip now, we're going to show the first one, is a couple of examples of where Jim was out in the field and you'll see the awe in his face when the thunder rumbles. So let's go ahead and roll the clip. Whoa! Is that lightning? Chris Christina! What? We just had a thunder snow. We just had a, a lightning strike and thunder here in Worcester. Busting out plus cars are... Our, uh, oh! Listen to that! Son of a... That's unbelievable! <laughs> oh, my goodness! Holy smoke! Just incredible! Robbie! Twice in one storm, baby! You talk about an overachiever. And who was that you were talking to? That was Rob Marciano, who was supposed to be joining me tonight, <laughs> who, who's now a big star with entertainment tonight. So uh, we wish him the best there. And um, he was right across the street doing live shots with me in Chicago. So anyway, so it took you 26 years to tell me how you felt about me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I really am only 5'8". Uh, I do look bigger on TV. <laughs> so uh, I know you guys all have pretty much noticed that at this point. I, I appreciate my colleagues uh, that I've been in this conference with, not only this year, but for, for many, many years, uh, to come out and, and hear me tonight. That really means a lot um, when you get respect from, from people you work with. So that really, that really means a lot to me. And there's one guy who could have easily blown this off because there was one morning when we were doing this conference, the steamboat, they just happened to get like 22, 23 inches of snow the, the night before. And, well, I skied the next day instead of went to his talk. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Jim White, I love you, man. I do. I'm, I'm glad I got that off my chest. All right. Uh, the first clip that you saw was, was Worcester, Mass. back in 1995. And, and Christina Abernathy used to work for us, was, was, was tossing it to me. So I'm just so focused on the camera, and I'm listening to her toss. And all of a sudden, I just see this flash. And being a New Englander myself, I had never seen thunder snow. So that was my first time that I got to experience that. So just this complete surprise reaction. Uh, Chicago was just, I mean, that was epic. That went on for 45 minutes, just nonstop. You know, you saw Mike Bettis jump. He was standing right next to me. Uh, you know, we were both just shocked at the way that the, the sound waves just went through the building. And it's just an amazing power that's going on when you're, when you're in thunderstorm. And I've seen it four times. I've actually been live four times when thunder snows occurred. So that's really, really cool. Um, unfortunately, it led to pretty much Chicago shutting down, but... Uh, but it was an awesome, awesome experience uh, to, be, to be in that. And you know what's interesting is through social media, I used to think this was so rare to have thunder snow. Every time somebody hears thunder, it's, I get a tweet. 
So I'm actually, I'm actually thinking that it's probably a little bit more common than we, than we think. Whether I've just kind of made the people aware of it now through my reaction that's played what, almost a million yeah. times on YouTube, or, or, or just the fact that it really is uh, a more dynamic atmosphere these days. Who knows? But uh, I, everybody gets to experience it, and they want me to know about it. It's awesome. The uh, interesting thing is, and uh, we'll give tours at the Weather Channel, et cetera, and people go, Are you not, they don't send you out in all that weather, do they? And I'm like, unfortunately not. I mean, it, there's a passion there for wanting it. I've only seen thunder snow on observations coming through the system. I've never been out there when it happened, so maybe someday. I know, but now you know why they sent me out, by the way. <laughs> the fact that I took too much time on the key wall, they're like, let's get this guy out of here so we can get other people some time on the air. Um, the second thing that we want to show you here is uh, in Chicago. Speaking of Chicago, we'll just go from Chicago to Chicago. And this was a, a, a Mar early March day where they had a, it was warm. It was 45 degrees ahead of a cold front. And then this cold front comes rocking through. I'm standing right on the lake. So when winds go out of the north, uh, east, out of the lake, you're getting the full brunt of them. And so we went from about 45 to 8 degrees in about four hours. Big temperature drop, big snow squalls. And, I mean, I just, this was one of the hardest winter. I mean, usually winter is just nice. It's playful, snow. Uh, you know, you saw my reaction to that. But this was just brutal to be outside. Check this out. I want to show you just how much of an eye I have on the weather here tonight as we zoom in to my left eye, which is right here facing the wind. The snow and ice just caking on the eye tonight as we've been standing out here now for the last half hour or so. It's currently 9.30 Central Time, and I just finished the last uh, live shot for the night, but I wanted to show you just standing out here for five to six minutes in winds over 40 miles an hour and heavy snow coming down. What's going on? I mean, I mean, you can see the snow is clearly melted on my face and then refroze almost instantly. I mean, it is absolutely frozen out here, but I wanted to make a point. This is why we ask you to stay inside and not do this sort of thing. So if you've got to use me to, uh, for a little abuse here just to make a point, then so be it. But it just feels awful. Now, I was actually taping a look live there, which is something that we'll do at the end of the night to send back to the Weather Channel. What I did not know was I actually had that frostbite. Did you see my nose? You see, so I, I had no idea I had that frostbite. And so I went back in the truck and looked at it. I'm like, oh, my goodness, we, look at my face. That, that's not just the snow. I got frostbite. So, I mean, that was just a great lesson to, to show at later dates for, for other people. And uh, at my expense, um, you know, it, it actually worked out. But I had no idea at the time that my face was that frozen. I mean, that's how strong that wind was. You just kind of I lost feeling and started getting frostbite. Yeah. It's pretty nasty. Yeah. I, I think for Jim, that's kind of a, it's like, this is the weather I love. This is why I grew up to be a meteorologist. And then to actually have it affect you that way, it's like, I can't, I can't deal with this. And it's, it's tough. It's tough. It, it but there are some other ones that we're going to show here. Go to the next clip. Yeah, this, you know, I, we go out on everything. Um, I've been in some of Mother Nature's worst temper tantrums. And it, it, it's, it's not easy. Uh, Katrina was definitely the one where I first experienced death in the field. And it's not easy to deal with that, uh, especially on a large scale. So as a broadcaster, you have to try and gather yourself just like a soldier. And you realize you have a job to do. And, and, and you try and do it the best way you can and, and get the word out. So Katrina was definitely tough for me. It was hard to leave Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, I, I felt like I was abandoning people. It was really psychologically difficult. But, you know. It's interesting to tell a um, little story about Jim. Um, they were set up in Gulfport and you know he's at 29 feet. We should be fine. And, and that's one thing we try to really emphasize with our crews. And you'll even see Jim say this. We're going in there. <coughs> this is not safe to be out here. I know it may look great. It's been great up until now, but now it's getting life-threatening. This is what I'm doing and this is mm -hmm. what I encourage all of you to do. And it happened to be Jim was at a, uh, it was a hospital? Oh, it, was hospital. The, it was the Armed Forces Retirement Home. It was one of two in the nation. There was one in Washington, and there was one in Gulfport, which has now been rebuilt as an incredible fortress. They got a bowling alley. They got an Olympic swimming pool. I mean, they really did it right. And it's uh, 30 feet above sea level, not, not 20, as it was during, uh, during Katrina. But either way, the, what happened during that storm uh, in Gulfport was, uh, you know, the surge came in. I mean, literally in 15 minutes, we had water rise of 20 feet. Uh, we went in to get, you know, a, a little breakfast with the, with the soldiers in, in the mess hall, and we came back out, 
and the whole parking lot is underwater. Our cars are you know, bobbing around like a little rubber duckies, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, 27 feet, uh, how can this water be this high? This is impossible. Anyway, come to find out we were only at 20 feet, but that's another story. Either way, um, at that point when the water started coming into the building, it wasn't about the TV anymore. It was about getting uh, soldiers upstairs. It was about getting uh, you know, invalids with these battery-powered wheelchairs upstairs. Now you've lost air conditioning in this building, so those plastic stairs turn into slippery you know, things. And we had the Navy CB unit, the local Navy CB unit there with us, and we, we managed to get everybody upstairs, and there was no loss of life. Uh, and, and so once things like that happen, it's not about the TV anymore. It's about getting people out of harm's way. Yeah, and, and Jim, I, I mean, I heard the story after a little bit that afternoon where, well, hey, it's coming in, the surge, where's can't, why is can't story not live? We're just asking, what's going on? I thought I'd see more of this. And they said, Jim's busy right now, and he was helping those people. Well, that, that and the fact that, yeah. you know, we lost, we lost our truck. cameras, we lost our yeah. satellite truck. I mean, <laughs> it was floating around in the parking lot. I'm telling you, you just, you, you try to get you, uh, being a meteorologist, you kind of know what storm surge does. You know the power of the wind and things like that, but you try and, you know, get your cameraman and your producer ready. And it's like, you know, guys, uh, you're going to see things you probably haven't seen before in your life. You're going to see cars bobbing around in the parking lot. You're going to see trees floating across the park. Windows are going to break. Winds are going to howl and make this awful screeching noise like you've never heard before. Uh, so just prepare for yourselves for that because it's just going to get worse as we go on through the day. And Jim was talking about the, you know, you, you then you feel what these people are going through. It, it transfers from the all of the weather to how people are impacted. I'll just tell one story also about Katrina. Uh, Jeff Morrow, mm -hmm. good friend of mine, he was in my wedding. Um, he was oh, yeah. down there reporting yeah. from New Orleans. And so <coughs> I guess at some point it, they made the determination that, okay, you need to go back over Lake Pontchartrain and get back on higher ground. And so it's like he said it was 4.30 in the afternoon. And he goes to say, and the people knew who the Weather Channel people were or whatever. And there's this young girl, about 21, working behind the counter. And he says, we're going to be checking out. And she goes, why? Well, we think it's going to get pretty bad. She goes, well, how bad's it going to get? And tears started coming down this girl's eyes. And he goes, and Jeff just turned to her and said, look, I, we got an extra seat in the truck if you want to go. And she says, no, I got to work this shift till whatever time it was. And Jeff just said he had this heart-wrenching thing. He's got to say, you know, he's like, well, if you don't feel, I mean, we're going because we think there might be a risk. And there's, there's this girl with a tear coming down her eyes. She's working at the hotel. And it's like, well, this is my job. This is what I've got to do. I mean, I think there were some windows blown out of that hotel. Hopefully oh, yeah. she was safe and everything. You know, they got people into an interior room. But that's some of the stuff that, that they face out in the field, just the people side of it. You know, I mean, I, I won't. When I was 22 years old and came to the Weather Channel and I got a chance to go out in the field, uh, Andrew was my first storm. Not, not Miami, the second landfall in Louisiana. And, you know, what an adrenaline rush. I won't lie to you. It was awesome being out there, just getting hammered by the wind. Uh, you know, as a kid, that's all I did was play outside in Vermont. Snow, rain, whatever. I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning to shovel the driveway for my mother so she'd get out to work. Um, so really, I just considered going out in the field kind of an extension of my childhood. <laughs> but it, it was really during Katrina, with an impactful storm like that, uh, that's where I said, uh, kind of transition out of this being an adrenaline rush for me to more of a, you know what, you, you, you help, you need to help people, you need to get people out of harm's way. This, this just shouldn't be happening. Uh, people have to understand that they live in an evacuation zone, and when that zone is asked to evacuate, they need to leave. So that's where my, that's where I kind of matured, if you will. I grew up in the field, and I knew that my, the way that I approached going out in the field had to change. And, um, that's and what I did. Speaking of which, we've got another one. We Isaac. did. Let, let's take you to this forward fast a little bit to this year. Uh, went out and did Hurricane Isaac. And when you have a minimal hurricane and you're in a city, it's very difficult to cover a storm. So sometimes the best shots are actually between buildings where the water is, or the air, I should say, is compressed and accelerated through those buildings. And we just happen to find one spot. And, it's, and again, it's not just me out there. It's my cameraman. It's my producers. I mean, these guys are in it with me. And we found this great shot in this great location. And uh, let's show you what I faced. Good morning from the Canal Street here in New Orleans where the winds continue to howl through these streets. I don't know if you can see and how well you can see this shot behind me here, but I'm about to step into this. 
uh, you know, we've been talking about how the wind just kind of funnels through these buildings. And once you get out and through here, it's just a whole different world. I mean, at times, the winds can gust pretty strong. Oh, man. That's, and the rain is very, very, very hard when it comes down like that. But, I mean, think, you know, I'm taking a beating here down to the ground. Imagine what these buildings are taking as we're just dealing with these sheets of rain and winds that are howling 50, 60 miles per hour. this one out guys. I'm gonna ride this one out right here. It is really hard to stand up right now. Oh that's I mentioned the rain is just killing me. For whatever it's worth I hope I'm making Tebow proud. So, that pretty was rough. You, were you feeling well that day? I was not feeling well that way, uh, that day. <laughs> little, <laughs> little does everybody know that uh, I had just come back from London to the Olympics. One of the, um, the greatest things about having NBC uh, be, our, be our owner is to uh, be able to do other things with them, whether it be on the Golf Channel or to uh, do NBC Sports, whether it be Sunday Night Football and sometimes it's the Olympics, which has just been an awesome opportunity, a whole different part of, of my career that I've never, ever experienced. So. Uh, that was awesome. Unfortunately, I had just gotten back from the Olympics. A week later, uh, here comes Isaac. So there was really no, I had to get back in the studio. And, and there was no rest for the weary. The unfortunate part is, is I came down with a case of the shingles. That's the true story. I, I was out there with shingles. So uh, honestly, as awful as that is, and I mean, if you've ever heard of shingles, it just... It's a rash. It's, it, it feels like you're just getting prickled by a million pins. And mine was really bad right here on the midsection. Um, but it felt so good to have that rain hitting my head. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that awful? But it's a true story. And <laughs> at least for about 24 hours, it was, it was a break from the shingles. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you see what we go through. And, uh, you know, we try to tell the best story that we can. And those winds, by the way, there was some folks out there with an anemometer. Uh, they were clocked at about 84 miles an hour. So that was much stronger than 50, 60 miles an hour. Uh, either way, it was, it, was, it was a beating all morning. So you saw the weather channel shots. You see me on once every half hour. But in between that, yeah. there's the shots for the say. Seattle stations. There's the shots for Los Angeles. There's the shots for New York, Washington, D.C., uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, wherever our affiliates are. Um, <laughs> so we were literally just out there cranking them out one right after the other. Yeah, and I think, I mean, Jim might be able to speak to this, and I've never had to do it. But, I mean, the amount of sleep you get is probably four hours if you're lucky. Yeah. The, the broadcast day has really changed. Um, TV, and instead of, okay, you're on at 6 in the morning and, you know, you do the, the news and then you're on again at uh, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Well, now, especially in morning television, we start broadcasts at, at, at 5 o'clock, sometimes 4 o'clock. When we're talking a situation a lot of the like people that. that are here this week. We're talking about how the morning news has expanded to right. four o'clock. So these people are getting up at 1:30 in the morning to right. get to so work. Right. So they they expect us to be live that morning. Uh, and oftentimes I'll do you know the nightly news hit and then shows for the Weather Channel. So it's it's uh, it's it's a short night, but there's an adrenaline that keeps you going without a doubt until your voice goes. Then you're <laughs> then you're in trouble. 
But, but you, you do see the enthusiasm, and to be able to do right. that as long of the hours that these guys put in, and again, we see them on the Weather Channel. They'll do a hit at the top of the hour, and we'll see them again. At the, in between there, they're not resting. They're doing hits for NBC, and you know, affiliate stations right. work together, and it might be an NBC affiliate in, as he said, Seattle or in Denver or whatever. So they're like, but it's good. It's a good relationship. So sometimes we're like, oh, there's a snowstorm coming through Denver. It's mm -hmm. marginal. Well, we've got our friends there at Denver uh, that'll, that'll report back about what's going on there. So there's certain markets we have some good friends that these guys help build those relationships. And, and it's kind of funny, um, <laughs> before I get to go out in the field, I, I do get to pick my spot, which is nice. But sometimes it's hard getting a, a cameraman because the cameraman that they're trying to get goes, who, well, who am I working with? No, it's Cantori. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to do this one because they know I'm going to be out in the worst of the stuff. <laughs> uh, so, so sometimes it's hard to get a, a, a cameraman out there to, to work with me. But the, I'm telling you right now, I mean, you see me, but I could not do it without the, the folks behind the scenes. The, you know, Cecil setting up the satellite truck. I mean, we had to park that thing and, 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 and get, you know, for him to get that shot up. I mean, there's so much that you don't see that goes into making uh, those shots. And uh, it's, it's, it's awesome. And then even awesome sometimes we'll, get, we'll hear stories about, you know, like, okay, we got Cantori here, we got so-and-so here, and then you'll say, oh, no, we're not going to have him for two hours because the local officials have said we're, you know. Yeah, sometimes we have to move. I mean, all, all of a sudden if there's uh, a tornado and we'll get there first on the scene, a lot of times that will happen yeah. in tornadoes, and they're going to say, all right, look, we've, we're going to move the media, so we've got to break down. Uh, and do a shot. So everything that we've set up and we're showing, we have to break down and, and move to another location. But it's just part of the game. It's just part of the game. Um, All right. But here's, well, yeah, what we're going to do now is actually move on and do a, do a little different story. This is Sandy. This is the one everybody remembers. And what's interesting about this broadcast is, is this is kind of pre-Sandy and then during uh, when the storm comes in. And I think, first of all, as, as a broadcast entity, the Weather Channel has never looked better. We really did a great job with Sandy. In, in all aspects. Uh, and I, you know, I love, you know, Brian Norcross is our hurricane specialist. I love the enthusiasm he brings to it. Uh, I love the NBC input as well. I mean, it just really makes it a, a, a great entity. But what's interesting now is I've done these enough to kind of know how the system works. I was in Irene last, you know, two years ago when it came to New York. I knew there was an evacuation order. Uh, I knew with Sandy uh, where the surge was going to be from the National Weather Service. So, you know, when the mayor comes out, I'm expecting an evacuation order. Uh, the other issue at, at hand here was the Hurricane Center decided they were not going to put up hurricane watches in the morning. And I just thought that was ludicrous uh, because that is the tool that I have that has the most gravitas to get people out of harm's way. Without that hurricane warning, I have to go and explain, well, it's going to become this extra tropical system and it's not going to be fully tropical, but it will have some tropical characteristics like the surge. Anyway, I, I don't need to be wasting my time doing that. I need to tell you the impacts and why you need to leave and where you are in the surge zone. Anyway, either way, so, so we're getting all these words, the first couple of clips you're going to see. Uh, and, and this is me having a conversation with Brian about, quite frankly, our displeasure in, in, in not having the mayor evacuate the city. Uh, Brian, we talked the last half hour about the uh, bite from the mayor deciding that uh, they didn't need evacuations at this time and probably were not planning to do any. And obviously that raised uh, quite a concern with us. This needs to pay a second visit uh, in, in terms of what we have here because that, that left hook, these astronomical high tides, the kind of waves that are predicted, and the longevity of all that water being pushed up into an area where it can't get out. I just don't know if we're going to have less surge, and, and I'm, so I'm feeling very uncomfortable about that. Either way, Brian, uh, you know, it, it's just it's uncharted territory, isn't it? Well, it is, but uh, you know, we have the surge, plus we have the waves, and we have, as I was talking about earlier, I don't know if you heard, Jim, we have this tremendous amount of energy in the water that we will be more than we had with Irene. So I echo what you say, that this is, uh, this is a very tough call that the mayor is making. Uh, another foot of surge that's two feet. Uh, we cannot stay here. We're going to have to break down. But you can certainly see, uh, even since we started talking, Brian, yeah, I see now it. I see it, we've got about 10 inches. Yeah, now we've got about 10 inches of water here, and it just continues to come up. There's no retreating back. It's pretty much this sidewalk area and uh, is now onto the grass. So it, it is definitely rising uh, pretty quickly, actually. We can see the water up to your knees there and it was not that high when you uh, you started out just a few minutes ago no 
No, and that's what we're talking about. This is about where this, uh, this Irene level was in the bottom of these benches. This is yeah. exactly what I dealt with. And, and we already know that the surge is higher. We've already uh, determined that. So uh, we're not at high tide yet. Uh, we're not seeing that, that wind change here like you talked about yet, Brian, which could force even more water up here. So, uh, you know, again, I, I agree with that. I don't think we're done. I don't think we're done with this water rise at all. Yeah. The other thing, guys, look at this. Jersey City, got the lights on. Part of it, though, completely in the dark. Uh, can't see much over towards Staten Island as well. Brooklyn, I've also seen a ton of power flashes down that way. This is absolutely an incredible sight. Yeah, it was. So, so once the water got above Irene's level, because I was there for Irene, uh, I knew we were in trouble. And, and uh, you know, to see what was going on in Jersey City and Brooklyn, all these power flashes, uh, and then smelling the smoke, you know, obviously it was the next day that we found out that uh, that area was, you know, suffered a tremendous amount of fires as well. So uh, it, it was an unthinkable situation. We had record surge. And, I mean, thank, goodness the, thank goodness the mayor finally did issue that evacuation order. But still, uh, the earlier the better. Um, the earlier the better. It, it, was, it was a tough storm. It was a really tough storm because, like I said, it was uncharted territory. Right. You know, it was this, you know, what we saw the hurricane part of it. Uh, West Virginia is seeing uh, a three-foot blizzard with 80-mile-per-hour winds. Uh, the Great Lakes are seeing huge waves, record wave heights coming in off of, uh, off of Lake Erie and Lake Michigan. I mean, just, just unprecedented territory. I mean, you're talking about a tropical storm wind field on this thing that was about 947 miles. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty... That's pretty big. Yeah, it's just nothing. And the whole, as Jim mentioned, the frustration about not having hurricane warnings. And this is something that, I mean, we deal with all the time, which is people get a concept of, look, I've grown up. I lived mm -hmm. here. We had a Category 2 hurricane, and I was just fine. We were okay. And it's hard to get, uh, we, in one of our discussions, Dr. Nab, who is head of the Hurricane Center, was here this week. And we were talking about this fact, and we at the Weather Channel have the, the, this awareness about everybody seems to be locked into the category and that kind of judges what they're going to do related to and, and it's so much it's so misleading because the category is just a measure of the highest wind it says nothing about well how like sandy how how much distance are those winds above Tropical storm force. Right, but to, to my point, though, yeah. that having that hurricane warning yes. uh, is huge. And, and since Sandy, what the Hurricane Center has done is put out new like, guidance, if you will, for them, or protocol, where if something does become extra tropical, going from a tropical system to, to a mid-latitude system, during its time over the ocean and threatening a landmass, they can issue hurricane warnings now. All right? So... In a way, it's kind of like we fixed the problem. Yeah. And, you know? and then the other side of it, and Jim saw it in Katrina, which is there's a category there. It's a three. It was barely a two, I think, is what they officially had it, high two, low three. But it was huge. Right. And that's the same thing with Sandy. And then, so all that, and Brian said it there when he was talking with Jim about we got the wind, we got the waves, the water can't go anywhere. It's coming into this you know, convergence of the coast and all of that. And what you really start to see out of all of this, and Brian said it, it's the energy that this thing has, just it's mm -hmm. building up the ocean. And, you know, there's rules of thumb, this category will bring this storm surge, and da-da-da-da, but every storm is unique. And, and I think the whole community, since Sandy, in addition to what they're doing, big improvement right. there, is how can we communicate to people this concept of storm surge? And we've had it this year, the two landfalling hurricanes. The wind wasn't the biggest story. As much as Jim was getting battered there, it was the water. Was the water and yeah. that's the biggest fear with a tropical storm or hurricane making landfall. It can bring a lot of rain because the tropical air masses can hold so much water. And in addition to that, it can just push water and all that energy can turn into taking the ocean and pushing it where it normally isn't. Yeah, Sandy was a long ordeal. It was, it was 14 days, and to try and get back to our hotel after our coverage of Sandy that night, uh, we, I mean, we're going up one-way streets. There's so many streets that are underwater. There's cars bobbing around. You can see water rushing into basements in lower Manhattan, uh, into the subways. I mean, it was like, it was, it was like a movie set. We're like right there on a movie set, but you know, this is real life going on. And, you know, Certainly, we've heard Governor Christie and, and, and even Governor Cuomo really talk about 
the changing climate and this extreme weather. And we can go back 10 years, we can go back 20 years, but we've certainly seen the extremes across not only our country, but the globe really ramp up. And, and that is a, uh, a certainly a sign, I think, of, of, of what uh, this earth is trying to do in the fact that we have changed it. We have put up carbon dioxide at historic levels. There's never been as much CO2 in the atmosphere. I have two climatologists right here who <laughs> have been telling us about that uh, for the last uh, five to 10 years. So the earth is trying to compensate for that and it's changing. And, and we've seen uh, results of that. Now I'm not saying that each particular weather event that happens is strictly to climate change, but there was a wonderful talk today uh, by Dr. Jennifer Francis from Rutgers. I don't know if she's here or not but where she, she, is here. she is here, and she had a phenomenal talk today where really for, for the first time, you know, we're, we're getting all this information on climate, but she went ahead and just connected the dots, all right? Uh, and it really all kind of goes back to what's happening with that Arctic ice, all right? And, and she took that, and she says, well, because of this, then that. Then, well, because of that, then this. So not a direct link, certainly, to, okay, well, because of Keep climate storm. change, Sandy happened, but because of what we see, it may have had an influence on it. And that's really important, and that's something that we need to watch uh, as we go down the road. So um, we have one little last clip at the end, and we'll hold off on that. I just thought now that we've seen these were our core clips where Jim's out there and different. If any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask Jim, either about these clips or about Jim out in the field or whatever, and when we do this, um, we're going to ask someone will bring you a microphone. We've got a gentleman right in the back there. Let me get the microphone. <laughs> uh, I, thank you, thank you so much for making me feel at home, and uh, I really appreciate it. The green flash. What what this gentleman is referring to is a is a situation at you know. I've never seen it. I've never seen pictures of it, but I heard other people have seen it. Actually, John Morales is here from Miami, and he's probably, uh, he, he could, John, have you ever seen a green flag? I have not personally seen it, but I've heard about it in the office. Right. It, it, it's, it's, it's the end of the day where the sun, the sun just, you know, clears the horizon, and they say there's this green flash that you see with the optics. Um, like I said, I've never seen it. Uh, I've never seen pictures of it, but um, people have said that they've seen it. And I, I mean, if you want to get down and spend a little time in Miami, uh, let me know. <laughs> let, me know <laughs> let me know what happens. I'd love to know if it's true or false because I, I, I haven't seen it. Maybe that has a little something Coast? to do. Well, yeah. Miami has a Well, yeah, but you they can, can see the other side. Yeah. <laughs> the keys or the keys, yeah. you know, somewhere. Okay. Other? You have a question or? Anyone else? Yes. Oh, go ahead. So when you're in some of these situations, what is the size of the team that's with you, the craftsmen, and should I outline who they are and what they do? Okay, it's, uh, there's, and I use this term loosely, the talent, uh, <laughs> myself. Um, <laughs> there are usually uh, two cameramen. One, one of them runs the camera, the other one's audio, and sometimes they'll switch off. Um, we have a producer out in the field. And there is also the satellite truck operator. So what's that, five? Uh, f usually about five. Sometimes if we're doing a hit for, for nightly news or, or the Today Show, uh, that team jumps by four, fourfold. Uh, you know, they, they just, it's, it's a much bigger production and, and it's a much bigger staff, which is kind of nice because usually they bring food and that's something that's pretty sparse when you're covering a hurricane or a tropical storm. So uh, that, that's usually the crew, crew allotment. Hi, Jim. Hey. I'm one of your biggest fans. Um, I guess my question is, um, while out in the field, was there any specific moment or event that was the most frightening for your life? Good question. Any, any particular moment that was, that was frightening? You know what's really weird is I, is I just, I don't get scared out there for some reason. I mean, it, it, when, you're, when you're just focused on the job at hand, it's, uh, maybe that's not a good thing, no actually. Tornadoes. No tornadoes. I mean... Actually, you know what? Okay, I will tell you. We were out tornado chasing one time, and, and, and I think it was in Kansas, and we're just out there standing, watching this, you know, slowly rotating wall cloud with, with the storm off in the distance, and all of a sudden, I mean, it must have been 30 yards at the most. Boom! Bolt of lightning right next to me. That scared me. Okay, that scared me, and that was the end of that. 
everybody. We're going. Back we're in. done. We're we're done. Where and was that? Uh, somewhere in Kansas. Kansas? Yeah, yeah, yeah somewhere in Kansas. And I'll never forget this story. You guys want to hear the funniest part of this story? So we're out. We actually find the tornado. It's the only one that day. And we're looking at this huge wedge tornado down in this cornfield. So it's not bothering anybody. So we're shooting it. We're filming it. And they're like, what? Guys, you got to get back to the satellite truck and do a live shot. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we couldn't get the satellite truck to us because we're on a dirt road. And you, when you're on a dirt road and you're, it's muddy, that's the end of that. Uh, especially if it starts to rain, which it usually does. But, I mean, here's this beautiful cone tornado, and i got to leave. So that was, that was kind of rough. Wait, I can think of one. that might. I, I don't know that it scared you, but it raised a lot of eyebrows. There was a coastal event in central northern Florida. I think you had a ladder because of all the beach erosion. Yeah. Didn't, didn't the camera get wet? That wasn't that. that oh, that, that wasn't, wasn't that. Situation. that situation. That was another storm <laughs> on, on, the, uh, on the outer banks of North okay. Carolina. And, again, <laughs> sometimes... Um, the best shot, you can't be in the best position for the best TV. So you have to take your camera and go down to where the best action is. That just happened to be on the water. And so we went down the steps, and I'm like, oh, can't we shoot it from up here? No, get producers like, get down there, get down. <laughs> uh, all right, whatever, fine. I'm exhausted at this point. I, I, it's not one of the battles I'm going to choose. So my producer, uh, Eddie, is the name of the photographer, myself, we're down there, we shoot a look live, the waves are coming in. Next thing I know, we are under a, a huge wave. <laughs> and it takes Eddie down. So he's holding the camera up out of the water like this. <laughs> All right, God bless him, he tried to save the camera. And so, I mean, we're pulling him out, we're pulling him out. We finally get him up, here comes the next wave. And it just wiped us all out. Um, so anyway, I mean, don't go play in the surge. That's the lesson. <laughs> and um, regardless of the shot, I mean, you're responsible for your crew out there. And I, I, if I had the chance to do that again, I would have never done that. Yeah. So. You learned. The gentleman here. Uh, Alyssa's bringing you a microphone. Here you go. He's, she's got it. As you know, uh, probably uh, Summit County and the Vail Resorts and Aspen Resorts and stuff like that are very aware and feel that we need to do something about the climate uh, change that, that they feel that man is affecting. Uh, but there was an article in our local newspaper, which is the Summit Daily News, um, in the last couple of days that said that fully 50% of all of the uh, weather forecasters didn't really believe that there was a problem uh, with climate change. And yet the art article went on to say that um, the meteorologists probably had the best chance of educating people mm -hmm. in that regard to try and make a change. Have you seen this sort of thing in your industry, and uh, is there a way that, that uh, something can be you know, educated about that? Or? Actually, I'll start, and I'll let Jim jump in. This conference has done a lot to help that. Many conferences. Um, many conferences yeah. have come along as well, but this, I think, was one of the first uh, probably 10 or 12 years ago. And I'll, I'll admit, I was one of those meteorologists, and I can we, explain we, we to you why I was that kind of, why I, my thought process went there is I deal with meteorology. I'm dealing in the today to seven day time frame. We have models, computer models that help us a lot. And we've, I've seen those models just be completely out to lunch. And so I'm a meteorologist. I was trained that way. And then I have climatologists who have a, go to a totally different curriculum than I do, who are dealing with climate over ye decades and years and centuries and all of that. and they would tell me things that were going on when we're we're sitting there going, well the weather changes every year you know one year it's cold the next it's warm. it's variable and we got computer models that can't get three days right what do you tell me you got a model that says in a hundred years the average temperature of the world globe is going to raise two degrees celsius how, how can you trust these models are right, we can't do and it takes a while to realize that it's a completely different science it's a completely different perspective and i think you know for a long time and again, unfortunately, I think it got politicized. <laughs> um, so, but I think over time, conferences like this are bringing the climatologist and the meteorologist together. They are helping us understand. And I'll just throw one story in. One person I work with, Stu Ostro, who was very much a, there's no global one. And he actually was one person I know who took the time to do a lot of, on his own, what Jennifer has done, which is I'm seeing things, what's going on that caused what, you know, and we were talking about it today, just the jet stream flow. Instead of it just mo mostly going west to east, it's starting to go more north, 
to south. And what is it that's causing that? And we talk we're about this every dots. day, and we're connecting the dots. And I think more and more meteorologists are realizing the weather is, at least for me, doing this for 28 years, it's different than when it was when I started out. And so I think that is slowly happening. But to the extent, I mean, I know Dave Jones deals with a lot more meteorologists out there. What's your take? Well, I think um, <clears throat> Breckenridge allowed me to lose my voice here. So. <laughs> Um, I think there are a lot of meteorologists out there around the country um, who uh, don't want to take the time on television to try to explain climate and climate science because they just want to do the weather. So um, I think that uh, conferences like this, there are larger conferences, American Meteorological Society has conferences uh, that try to do that education through science. Uh, so we just need to keep pushing forward because it's guys like Jim and Dale at the Global Forecast Center within the Weather Channel. Other attendees to this conference are here in the audience who are local meteorologists in their markets. Um, need to take that initiative to really say, we are connecting the dots. You know, we are taking the presentations that we put together and putting them online. So Jennifer's presentation today uh, is going to be online probably in the next 24 hours. So other meteorologists can look at it and say, you know what? I am going to talk about climate on the air uh, because a lot of people just don't believe it. But when you look at the science, it's happening. Not only is it happening, we have to make a difference. We have to talk about how we're going to deal with it. It's going to affect everybody across the nation and across the world. And yeah, perhaps yeah. it already is. I mean, just go back and look at the history of, of you know, when climate change kind of came out. Climato like Dale said, we deal with from 10 seconds to 10 days. Climatologists deal with 10 days out through 10,000 years. Um, so they, climatologists came out and said, okay, listen, guys, this is huge. This is a big deal. The temperature of the Earth is going to rise 2 degrees in the next 50 years. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like it a little bit warmer? So, so what's happened since then is uh, meteorologists and climatologists have kind of come together because they have excellent points. I don't think these guys are in it for anything, but the fact that they're just good scientists and, and they have a story to tell and it's one that affects us. So just like me wanting to go out in the field and talk about how a weather system is going to come in and potentially wipe your house out, these guys are going to be like, you know what? I got something that could tell you that could change the, the climate and where you live and, and, and trees that grow uh, in your yard. They may not be able to grow there anymore. Water, water is huge and you're going to face that up here water. I mean, I drew, listen, I don't live out in Colorado. I live in Atlanta. That's where, I, that's where my suitcase and closet is. <laughs> Other than that, it's in a plane. But when I went by Lake Dillon and I saw that water like it was, I said, oh boy. And I drove up the front range and there's no snow. The buffalo are out there grazing, eating the grass. I said, this is not, this, these people need water and they get it from snow. So uh, like Jennifer talked about today, uh, is this a result? Potentially, can we go back and look at the dots because of this high amplitude pattern? Are our storms missing uh, Colorado altogether because of this pattern uh, that we see that we can go back to, you know, the ice that's actually melting? I mean, it was just it was, make sure you watch this presentation. All right, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that right now because it was really good. Um, so we're, we're facing now. Now we're all facing issues, and, and the fact is, is climatologists and meteorologists, I think, are coming together a lot more, and, and as we learn more. And as we meet people like Jennifer and Jim White who help us connect the dots and understand, all right, then we can get that information out. Because yes, uh, they have been telling us for years, you guys are our best line of defense and offense. Uh, I'm going to insert myself real quick. Yeah. I don't know a ton about any of this, but I've learned a lot over the last few years. And last year we had a speaker who was addressing how do we, how we communicate the same message to people that live in third world countries in very rural areas because they might have to change their whole crops. But who's out there telling them, you know, so there's a whole other layer besides just us who have access to the information, but the people that don't have access to the information, how that could potentially impact it. And that's part of the science that I think is really, that I learned last year, I thought was really, really cool. Like, it's not just, it's not just about us. Like, we need to be informing. Well, yeah, and just like Jennifer's presentation today started out, uh, she wasn't just talking about the United States. She was talking about extremes that have gone on all across the world, Venice, uh, in Russia, in the UK. Um, you know, and, and I, just take the United States last year, for example. 
warmest year on record in this country. Um, I think 19 states are their all-time record highs. I mean, just, just incredible, incredible numbers and statistics that are just out there. I mean, it, I just don't think the earth operates like that, uh, where we see so many extremes, unless something is changing. So it, 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 it's just kind of a, a, there's a lot of clues out there. We just got to pick them out. You have a question, sir? Dale and Jim, thanks for uh, sharing your time with us this evening and joining us in Breckenridge and Summit County. Um, Thank you. What I've got for you is uh, 12 months from now, roughly 12, 13 months, Sochi, Russia is going to host the next Winter Olympic Games. And Weather Channel has always been a big part, mm -hmm. like you identified earlier, of major sporting events. Tell us what the Weather Channel has to do in advance, say 12 months out now, of getting prepared. What's the homework assignment? Uh, I could start with that? one, and Jim has some stories. As the head of director of the Global Forecast Center, we do forecast for mm -hmm. the whole world, and we have points, and we try to. There are some holes out there, and to be honest with you, we've been at, in, a, in the process of filling in some holes in remote areas that you just we don't have the data, and it's hard to produce a forecast. So, with any Olympics that we have approached, we have learned exactly where the venues are. Six months ahead of time, we have added forecast points that were co-located with all the key venues and then did some quality control of those leading up to that so that we could present maps and say, okay, at this venue, there's this. Now, again, the venues aren't spread out that far that the weather is that dramatically different, but with right. the British Columbia Olympics in Vancouver, I mean, there's big elevation changes that the venues were exper that were, you know, some were like close, much closer to the coast at a higher mountain. It was a higher mountain, which is good, but you were much closer to the marine layer. And during that whole Olympics, it was very marginal. They had wet snow. They had some rain at times. So that's what we do is we try to make sure we understand where all the venues are, make sure we have forecast points that are represented anywhere. We put the humans where we think they can add value. We spent some time looking at those forecasts in British Columbia starting from about two weeks before the Olympics until after the Olympics. And we'll probably do the same thing uh, with the ones coming up in Russia where you're going soon. Yeah, we're going to take a trip to Sochi, um, I think, next month. Uh, like Vancouver, as Dale mentioned, Sochi faces challenges of being a, a warm climate that's holding a winter Olympics. They're influenced by uh, oceans. They're influenced by the Enso phase or the La Nina or, or, or El Nino. Uh, I can't remember which one makes it worse for them right now off the top of my head. But either way, uh, what they, I don't know if you guys know this, but over the last two years, they've been stockpiling snow. They've been stockpiling snow in these caves and the, these bunkers. So they, you know, they don't want to face a situation where, like in Vancouver, they had to be carting snow in on helicopters uh, because it was melting so fast. But that is the possibility. They know that, so they've been carting snow. And that's the story we're going to tell. The other thing I want to mention was, um, you know, as Dale and his team are, are preparing for these venues, uh, what's come along in recent years in terms of uh, internet and, 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 and your phone, I mean, you could be standing at a venue or you could be going to a venue and get that exact forecast, the exact hour uh, of, of what you're going to deal with, uh, uh, you know, on your phone. And so the tremendous ramp up in technology in that phase uh, allows us to give spot forecasts per hour, you know, per minute potentially, uh, in, on these different venues and watch how the weather changes. So, you know, our world has is, is grown in, in a great way. There's not anyone right away asking for questions. There is one more, one more. Okay, we'll do one more and then we're gonna show you one more clip. Let's go, go ahead in the back. You know, is, is there in fact, and the politics covers it so much, in fact, is there a consensus among climatologists? Number one, about climate change, and number two, that humans cause it? I, I think, if, if you yes. don't see that the climate's changing out there, there's something real wrong with your I remember with, in the 60s your thinking. it was global cooling. That yes, that's right. That's right. We actually at this conference had one of, the, one of the climatologists, Jim, who was it? One of the first ones that the CO2, they said it was going to get cooler and they had a, a sign wrong in an equation or something. Do you remember that? They came and talked to us. Do you remember? Was it? I can't remember who that was. I mean, one of the most interesting um, graphs that, that Jennifer showed today was, who, who was it? Tom Conway. Tom Conway? Yeah. Yeah, one or the Did, other. Is he still employed today? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one of the most interesting graphs that, that Jennifer showed today was um, what's, what's happening to the Earth's temperature over the last 20 years, okay? Um, and then how much CO2 is 
in the air and how the earth hasn't reacted to that CO2. And I, I mean, that's just like, holy smoke. So there's the potential certainly of a ramp up in, in, in global temperature, um, given just what we saw today. And yeah, I think there's, I think there's, less, there's less and less people. I mean, like I said, I was one that, and maybe it was denial because I love snow. So if the earth's warming, there's going to be less snow. Right. Uh, but I think a lot of people, it's, it's hard. And there's even some people at this conference that I've been at conferences 15 years ago that we were like, eh. And I think those people, as scientists, who are being presented the data in an objective way, um, I think we're, I'd say most of the meteorological community is, is coming on board. I think so. Yeah. Dave, how are we doing on time? So we have one, one uh, online question. Okay. A bunch of online questions, but okay. especially two Okay. And okay. Then, uh, we'll show the yeah, we'll show that last clip. Yep. Uh, this question comes from Kim Fuller. And Jim, she would like to know if you had your druthers, what would you change or improve about covering weather on air? What would I change uh, about covering weather in the field? Well, you know, it's, it's really weird, guys, because when you, when you go out there, I, okay, Jim, you're going to cover a hurricane. Uh, Jim, you're going to cover a tornado. You're going to cover a snowstorm. I, I have an idea what to pack. Uh, you know, I have an, a little idea in my head about what kind of hours I'm going to deal with. But... I don't know if you can really change anything because there's still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, there is the chance that you sleep in your vehicle, all right? Uh, there's the chance that you don't really get a good hot meal for a few days, and that's happened a lot. But that's just part of the job. So uh, I don't think I would change anything as much as I would just make sure that I'm always realizing I'm not going to be spoiled out there. Uh, and, and you know what? And, and sometimes you have to convince your, your team that because these, you know, a lot of these guys... Are, are, are on union, they're on shifts uh, of eight hours, and you know, when we're out there, we're, we're doubling that. We're working 16 hours. So it, it, not really changing anything, but just realizing all the time that it's not a, it's not a vacation in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> this is we're a vacation. We're working, but we're having a heck of a lot this of fun. This is a too. vacation. And uh, actually, you know, should we transition into the postel? Well, I was going to say, I'm going to lead into that, and if you have something right. else to say, I just want to, we're going to show you a little clip here, and this is, kind of makes the point that we saw Jim with the winds blowing at 84 miles an hour. And Jim is talking coherently, talking about what's going on <laughs> and even saying, that. this is why, this is why I wanted you out of here. I want to show you why when we say you should not be in this, this is why. And he can do that. And over the years, there's a lot of things that happen in the field. You're, you're hearing yourself three seconds later in your IFB. That happens. You'll see people, when people do that, that's the problem. They're like, it's out of sync. This is driving me nuts, and they'll pull it out. And so there's a lot of things that happen out there. People streak when you're doing live shots. <laughs> and you have to be able to keep yeah. your wits about yourself and be professional, and Jim does it very well. We're going to show you a little example of where back in the studio we sometimes have luxury. We're going to do a package to explain something. And so we're going to tape it, and it'll show like at 8 o'clock tonight. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And one of our newer experts, you know, very knowledgeable gentleman, Dr. Greg Postel. And so Jim and Greg are going to do a tape feature explaining right. something. I yeah, I, th I think the pattern change the actually pattern is, change, is yeah. what we're going to talk about. Um, so so this, is, this is on New Year's Eve okay. that we're doing this, which makes it even funnier. <laughs> but uh, let, let's, let's show how live TV goes sometimes, or even tape TV. Tape TV. TV. Right now is what is going to be sort of em emb emblem. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> you started early. Uh, a big change from how we ended 2012, isn't it? <laughs> Dude, what? Seriously. Well, <laughs> uh, you need a moment? No. I don't yeah, think you so. do. You think so? <laughs> okay, here we go. This is for real. This is this uh, is big, You've advanced this is big already. Time. Look, you got to yeah, go I'm, back. We're going to start here. Oh, because right. this is now. Because I, I'm worried about the time. I really am. <laughs> So much so that it's got you a bit giddy. It's got me all, all right. worked up. Okay, it's here we go, here we go. We're doing it. This is it. All right. 2013, everybody. I'm here with Dr. Greg Postel to talk about the beginning of 2013, the first seven days or so, and really how the pattern is going to... All right, that's it. I'm done. You know, this ain't happening. Here, I'll do it. I'll... No, we can See, do you it. can't do it. You, can... You're going to do it. You're gonna, we're going to get a minute into this. You're going to do it again. You're going to be like, oh, my God, this is oh. hilarious. My oh my god. god, give me one more chance. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> See? Yeah, I can do this. Oh Let's do god. one more. Mm -mm. 
Well, uh, Greg, thanks. It's been great ringing in the new year with you. <laughs> Take 25. <laughs> All right. Dude, no kidding. Help me. AJ, what do you think? Ladies and gentlemen, AJ Keen. Yeah. All right. That's what I said. All right. Coming up and ready? Got it. You got it. I think so. In three, two. Happy 2013, everybody. Dr. Greg Postel joins me now, and he's about to crack up. See? I knew it. We'll see you next year. Well, you have that luxury. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Well, do I need to wrap up online and take a few more questions? Or is there a question? No, I think... Can we show uh, the ice? Yes, no, that's I, what I was going to ask you guys. Do you want to show the ice? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we want to show you um, Arctic sea ice. I mean, when, when we go back and we start talking about, all right, what was that key piece of evidence that really changed your mind or, or you know, something now that we can actually visually look at? Uh, Jennifer brought with her today a, a loop, and actually you can get this right off the Internet, uh, of Arctic sea ice over the last 30 years, I believe it is, 30 years, and what's happened to it. So it's not just surface ice. I mean, think about this ice. It's, it's deep in areas. Uh, it's thin in areas. But we want to show you um, what's happened to Arctic sea ice, basically going back 30 years to present time. This was a, a very eye-opening experience for all of us today. Sound? Is this just the loop, or? I think it's, I think it's just the loop. You, you all right, so, so like Jennifer told us today, the, the white is the deep, it's the is old. the thick. Oh, thick the and thick. old. The thickest ice. And, and you know, the various circulation over the, uh, over the Arctic, the AO circulation, is and what's this, taking the ice out. You can see the, the year out. here. You can see the years. So during a year, as the summer goes on, the ice will shrink, right. and then it comes back during the winter. But if you look over time, you can see the trend. And, and look at just from 2000 up. I mean, this is... So, you know, not only the blue is disappearing, but also the white, which is the 207 thick ice. 207 was one of the bigger years that we lost a lot of sea ice. Starts again. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's what we started with, and what we've got now is a, a mere fraction of that. So, uh, from Jennifer's presentation, what she went on to do was, okay, well, if this is happening, uh, you know, when we're actually, now we've got open water, and you've got all this latent heat coming up, um, how is the atmosphere reacting to that down here in the lower 48? And I just thought it was a, just an amazing talk. And, um, and the know, other point of that is that's got to change the system. Right. Ice reflects, and you start taking, you know, a third of that ice away during the late summer months. That heat, the sun's energy, is getting absorbed by the water, where it used to be completely reflected back to space because of the white of the ice. Right. So we can sit back and do nothing. Um, and wonder if this is really true or not, or, or we can realize that we have to change our ways and, uh, and build a better mousetrap. Uh, you know, I can't say that a Sandy didn't happen a thousand years ago on the East Coast, but the fact is it's happening now. <laughs> and, and the fact that it could happen more frequently means we can't build right on the sand, water interface. Uh, so I, I, I certainly expect Governor Christie to, to build a, a better mousetrap on the East Coast when he, when he builds a the coast back and also uh, realize that storms like this are going to happen. Um, I don't know if it's next year or in the next hundred years, but I don't want to pay another $50 billion price tag. How about you guys? No. One last thing that I'd like to say um, for everybody is you, you all are curious about questions where you can go to find out more information. You can always go to the Weather Channel, which is weather.com. Uh, but uh, NOAA also has a great climate uh, presence. If you just go to climate Dot gov. Uh, you can see all sorts of visualizations, all sorts of uh, stories that are being put together uh, for that website. And uh, they're doing a good, a much better job now communicating the science of climate change and the impacts. So um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up the live streaming. We've had a number of other questions online we couldn't get to. Uh, we had uh, the viewership just kept going up, uh, which is terrific for this first uh, opportunity to, to invite you in as a community from you Breckenridge. So, <laughs> um, you know, Jim and Dale, thank you very much. And Kristen, would you like to close it out? Yes. Give them a huge round of applause. Excellent. Thank you.
mention a few of the other meteorologists that are here that are doing great work, um, and, and I think that afterwards you can tell these guys how much you want them to come back and do this again next year. So um, I think this is a Where do I sign? Yeah, okay, done. Um, but I do want to mention a few folks that are also here that might be your favorite local meteorologist at home. So I do want to give a shout out to Ashton Altieri. He used to be in Denver. He's now um, in Sacramento. So yeah, he's here visiting from Sacramento. All right. um, Kent Earhart, where are you, Kent? Are you still here? He's over there. Um, he Saint is Louis. from St. Louis. And no heckling yeah. from you tonight. Yeah. Wow, that's, you. that's <laughs> I what I want like, to clap for. I feel like I'm in the lineup. And on third base, we've got Bill Evans. Are you here? WABC out of New York. He's probably out whining and dining somebody. Yes. Um, but uh, he was, right. he's here this week as well. Paul Goodlow, also from the Weather Channel. Yes. Um, a, a big time skier as yeah. well. So yeah, he, I just want to mention him. Paul probably improved everybody's ski game. Uh, by being at this conference, yeah. so everybody he, tries to keep up with Paul, and it's not an easy task. He's legit. That's why I said try. Um, Samantha Moore, are you still here? Samantha's Samantha here. Moore's here. Um, oh, thank you. Um, from CNN. Thank yep. you. Yep. Um, sorry about that. John Morales um, from the NBC John. station NBC Six in Miami. And he has he actually got out and stomped snow yesterday, Whoa. and so he is. The man is what we like to call him. <laughs> um, actually, we like to call him something else, yeah. but I can't say it out loud. Oh, yeah, let's not do that. Um, um, Brad Panovich, are you here still? Or did you take off? Brad Panovich is out of Charlotte. Charlotte? And he is a weather geek to the core on a Twitter. It's, he's a great yeah, person to follow. He's a snow media. guy. Very yeah. big snow guy. Yep. Um, Cindy, Cindy Presler's is here. Um, sh she's also from St. Louis. St. Louis. Um, Jennifer, Ra I can never say your last Rick name, Jennifer Rick 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 She's here from Paducah, Kentucky, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Craig Stetzer, are you here as well? Stetzer. 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 Yes. Craig Stetzer, also from Miami. And then finally, um, our West Coaster, Matt Z Zafino. 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 God, I got that wrong every time. Is Matt here? Matt here? Um, Oh, he's still skiing. Still skiing yeah. um, he's out of Portland, and we had dinner last night, actually, and one of our ski patrollers, um, Bob Nothnagel, was with us, and they actually hiked in Nepal together like 20 years ago. Um, and they were sitting there and talking to John Morales. He's like, oh, I hiked with a meteorologist one time. He's like, what's his name? He's like, Matt Zafino. He's like, oh, he's sitting right there. <laughs> so, um, so it's really fun to have, um, like I said last night, these p folks in the Breck family and to be part of um, that the small knit community here that travels the world. and. Um, and is passionate about weather. So thank you guys so much. I'm sure that Jim will be available in Dale, of course, um, for a few photos, and then we will have to whisk them off to Yeah, and, and before so, you end, too, yeah. I mean, uh, we have a, a lot of the ladies and gentlemen who gave us talks this week, which uh, are, are just awesome to listen to. My classmate from Linden State College, Greg Carbon, is here from SPC. Uh, Dr. Jim White from CU is here, climatologist, and Dr. Jennifer, um, Jennifer uh, Francis, Francis is here from Rutgers as well. So. And she's the one who gave that excellent talk to us today. So. A few of our speakers, they, a lot of, they have a lot of commitment, so they'll come in for a day or two. So some of them aren't here the whole week. And we have a full list of all the speakers on the website for this conference, which is Storm Center. You can go to www.stormcenter.com and then slash WXC Summit for Weather Climate Summit. And that's one of the things that we did here <coughs> over the last few years, just to let you know about climate. We changed the name from the Weather Summit to the Weather and Climate Summit. That's how important it is. All right, so thank you so much. And sorry we didn't get everyone's questions in, but please, another round of applause for our guests. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Seriously. Good job, darling. Good job. <laughs>